So today is April 29th, 2022. We're going to have another talk today about uh, your history. So last time we left off, we were discussing, um, we were in the 50s, I believe, and we were discussing, um, you had been interviewing at for, you'd had some interviews for going to Rocketdyne. And, but that's pretty much where we um, cut oh, things off. You had two different okay. opportunities. You described um, one interviewing at Rocketdyne, then there was another one with working for, I forget the person's name. Um, yeah. But you told us, so obviously um, I, you, you started working at Rocketdyne, correct? Yeah, I, I, I think we covered why I left, uh, Lockheed Aircraft Service. Crash. Yep. And uh, uh, let's see now. I had a tip on uh, Rocketdyne. I forget where the tip came from, but the tip was to call a supervisor of a, a department at the field laboratory in the uh, Santa Susana uh, mountains or hills, but whatever they're called. And actually this supervisor lived in a house directly behind May and Sam. Now May and Sam had a house on Van Owen street, uh, maybe uh, a block and a half or so uh, west of White Oak. And uh, the block they were on had an alley running through it uh, parallel to Van Own Street. I forget the names of the two streets that, uh, that edged them, but across the alley and right behind Main Sam, was uh, where this supervisor lived. Again, and I don't recall his name. Uh, I called him on the phone. I don't particularly recall the conversation, but he asked me a lot of questions about uh, my my work history and other questions. I, I remember that. And we made an appointment uh, to visit him. Uh, I don't remember too much about the, the visit. Uh, apparently, I impressed him enough that uh, he hired me. And uh, I went up to uh, Rocketdyne. Uh, I went through. Uh, through the security to get on the place. Incidentally, that was, that was very tight. I, I remember that. And uh, I went through the employment process. Uh, and uh, I, I waited, I'm, I'm, there were uh, several days between then and when I was supposed to start, uh, I think now would be a time to ask me some questions because my my thoughts are on a million things right now, and I don't know where where to start. Okay, but, well, uh, give me so Rocketdyne okay. was building uh, rocket engines okay. at this time, right? For were they? Yeah, I mean, okay. this is the. Let, let Let me describe what Rocketdyne was. Uh, the first time I saw it, because I remember that. <clears throat> At the time I went uh, to work for Rocketdyne was in the fall of 1955. And that was in an area uh, where relations uh, with the Soviet Union were very iffy. Uh, we were working, when I say we, 
uh, Rocketdyne was uh, a division of North American Aviation at, at that time. And, and let me give you just a little bit of the history on uh, how Rocketdyne was, uh, the field laboratory was established. I think. Okay. Uh, I have seen innumerable uh, stories and uh, broadcasts on TV about the uh, German scientists who had developed a missile called the V2, which uh, rained down on uh, Britain during World War II. Uh, they were developed by uh, uh, this German scientist. You, you probably uh, know. Uh, can you? This so, German. There's a lot of German scientists. <laughs> well, yeah. Besides yeah. Einstein, I'm going drawing a blank on uh, which ones are. Uh, I, agree. I I have a blank too. Okay, that's that's not, that's not really important. Uh, he came to this country and uh, uh, started a, uh, a, a research uh, program in, uh, uh, let's see, Alabama, what's the name of the place? <laughs> Sorry about that, okay. They uh, started their, okay. And they uh, started a research, research on developing our, our first uh, rocket. Uh, a uh, development station was established in New Mexico at a place called White Sands. Uh, it, incidentally, it's still there today. Uh, it's almost like a national park. And uh, I, I won't go through all the uh, technical details because that's not important. But that's uh, uh, we we needed a place to test the engines. Uh, North American got the contract. They bought roughly uh, 12, 13, 1400 acres at the top of the Santa, Su Santa Susana Mountains, uh, one side of the mountain faced the San Fernando Valley, the other side faced uh, Simi Valley. And in the field laboratory, uh, as it was called, they, uh, they established it, and that included uh, a, a central uh, location where the uh, uh, management offices were lo located. They had a, uh, an extensive machine shop there. Uh, they had laboratories. And also at the same time, they established a, another uh, organization up there called Atomics International. Uh, to do studies on atomic power. And they even est established a small reactor up there. Uh, so we shared the place with uh, 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 Atomics in International. Now the field its laboratory itself consisted of the uh, uh, central buildings, where management and uh, uh, the machine shop and uh, everything else was located. And they uh, had sev uh, several sites on there. Uh, and the sites were named uh, A, B, C, and D. That would be uh, Alpha, uh, Beta, I forget what the C was, and the D was the delta stands. Each each section had uh, three engine test stands, and these were 
stands in which a, a rocket engine could be mounted vertically. Uh, be, below it were uh, large chambers uh, that deflected the downward uh, exit of the uh, uh, of the thrust uh, that was developed by the engine and deflected it outward. And to keep from burning everything up, they injected large quantities of water. They had at the top. They had built a large a water tank. Uh, they also, in addition to the uh, uh, areas where they had the uh, engine test stands, I think it was a total of either nine or twelve. Uh, Test and I forget what what the number was. They had what's called a components test laboratory, or CTL. And in the components test laboratory, they had outside facilities for mounting the developed components, and these were like uh, uh, <clears throat> injector nozzles for the uh, rocket engines. Uh, various types of uh, valves, that is, uh, shutoff valves that uh, would work uh, with propellants such as the liquid oxygen, uh, uh, <clears throat> jet fuel, which was called JP, uh, and also various rocket engine and chemicals, which were extremely hazardous. And they had uh, cells at the back of the laboratory where these uh, very uh, different components could be uh, uh, mounted and tested. And <clears throat> each of these cells had a uh, instrumentation It's called a, a cabinet instrumentation cabinet, in in which uh, uh, cables led from this instrumentation cabinet to the instrumentation room just behind the test cells. Now I'm getting into something that's that's uh, really uh, not uh, necessary. I'm just laying the groundwork for what I'm going to talk about later. Uh, the tanks that were mounted over the test cells, uh, there were two of them. One of them would carry the oxidant, which was liquid oxygen, and the other would carry the fuel, uh, mostly J pill, J uh, jet uh, fuel. It was an, ad an adaption of the fuel that the uh, uh, aircraft jet engine used. And also, we tested several. Uh, hazardous uh, fuels. Uh, it's it, when I when I read about it and think of uh, my contact with it, and I'm still alive. It it amazes me. Okay, so so that's what I went to work testing uh, uh, components there. So and, so uh, specifically, yeah. what was your job? Uh, for, okay. I mean, it probably I, evolved okay. over the years. But okay. like, what what were you responsible? What did you on a day to day basis? What I, were you involved I, with? I I I was a I was a technician. I I um, they had classes of uh, they had three classes. Uh, there was uh, class B and class A. Class B was for mostly you know newcomers. At at the time, I was a licensed airframe and power plant uh, uh, tech, uh, technician uh, in which I worked when I worked at Lockheed Aircraft Service, uh, that's what I did. Uh, and the, the, the modification of aircraft and aircraft uh, engines. Uh, 
I don't know whether I, did I talk about what I did at Lockheed Aircraft Service? Yes, you have. Yeah. We've talked about that. Okay. And so uh, that was once the, one of the reasons they hired me. I, I was an experienced uh, plane with their, uh, working on airplanes. Now there, there is no experience for rocket engines. Uh, there's no backlog of experienced people to do that because this, this was new. And what I mean by new, something that was started after the war when we start bringing uh, Vaughn, <laughs> I almost thought of his name again, but uh, <clears throat> he is the one that developed the uh, Apollo project. Uh, basically. Okay, so let's uh, get back to Rocketdyne. Uh, we were, I, I worked on components. We would mount components and then uh, we would uh, load uh, propellants that is uh, liquid oxygen and whatever fuel we were using, which was generally uh, uh, jet fuel and uh, run these tests in a, uh, we had a council with a small window <clears throat> that looked out into the test so we can see it. Uh, <clears throat> we would run the test and there was large banks of uh, recording instruments behind us. Now these recording instruments, and th the instruments recorded on a round uh, uh, instrument uh, that looked a lot like a, uh, a a record player with a uh, with an arm on it, and the uh, the recording would would revolve and the arm would go back and forth over, uh, let's just say from zero to 100%. And, and it also had a time slot on it. So they had both time uh, plus and minus. And these perimeters would be recorded and th there was a separate party for instrumentation then. We we were the technicians who worked on it on the uh, on the components inside the lab, mounted them outside in the cells, and the instrumentation men they took care of all the instrumentation. Then uh, there were uh, engineers, and each each thing we uh, we tested had a program number, and uh, we had a, a log. When we started. We had a log on. We had to keep time, uh, how much time we spent on this or that, et cetera. And so that's what the component test lab was. And I, I worked in the test, component test lab for roughly four years until 1969. Uh, and all this time now, they're building these uh, uh, test cells Right across from the components test lab, we had a, a test stand area called the bowl area. And there were three test stands. And we we can see the the these test stands from the front entrance of the components test lab. And uh, uh, all, all three of bowl one, two, and three were all uh, being, uh, they were tested with various engines, uh, variations of engines, et cetera. So there were tests going on all the time uh, that I can remember. Uh, after four years, for whatever reason, I was transferred to, a, to another area called the Delta area. And uh, we had gone from the, the engines that uh, powered our, our First missile. Uh, that's the one that Stanley that put our first uh, astronaut into space. I think in 1956 or 57. I for, I, I forget. Uh, 
we we started testing uh, engines at Delta uh, for uh, the Atlas missile, uh, the Jupiter missile, and for uh, Atlas Jupiter. What was what was the third one? I I can't think of the name of it. Uh, the the third one was a variation uh, of the Jupiter. Uh, the, the Jupiter had two stages. That is a first stage, and then after the first stage burned out, it was uh, it separated, and the second stage took over. Uh, but the, the Atlas had. Instead of two stages, it had a, a booster engine and what's called a sustainer engine between the booster. And uh, after it was launched, instead of separation of two, so we would have two different vehicles, the booster engine itself was ejected to get the, when all the, propellants for the booster were used up. Uh, of course, they lost that weight and they ejected the booster engines, the two booster engines and the sustainer engine mounted between them uh, was ignited. Uh, accomplished the same thing in a different way. I don't know why they did that, but it also uh, created a lot of problems that we had to work out. Um, after the Atlas and the uh, uh, Jupiter uh, program, uh, Apollo uh, appeared on us. Uh, the Apollo missile was uh, a giant missile in which the engines were so big that they had to go up in the up in the desert. Uh, east of uh, what's the big aerospace uh, facility up there called? Oh, are you talking about? Um, uh, wow, well, I just went blank on it. Well, are you talking about up by Mojave? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, they established another test stand, uh, maybe 30 miles east of there in the, in the foothills of the Sierra and Nevadas, and they hauled these um, these big monstrous uh, uh, booster engines. Each one developed over a million pounds of thrust. When you think the 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 engines we were testing at the field laboratory had had roughly anywhere is dependent on their size from maybe one hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand pounds of thrust. So when um, the Apollo booster engine had five of these million pound thrust engines. They, they were enormous. They were enormous. Uh, we were not capable of testing the big engines, but we could uh, uh, test the, the smaller ones now. So I don't want to get uh, too much more into the what the Apollo product was, people know that. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about me. So you, uh, that pretty well covers what I did at, at Rocketdyne. Can I can I ask some questions? Yeah, ask me questions. That's what we're here for. Well, no, I, I actually like enjoying. I enjoy listening to what you have to say. And uh, people like my age don't know as much about the Apollo program as I probably should. So actually, we if depending on what you were involved with. I actually do want to get into that. Uh, just, are you talking about just from a second ago? Was it Edwards Air Force Base that you're referring to? Edwards, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they established a space for uh, testing the uh, uh, these these big rocket engines. I I I was never up there. I never had an opportunity to get there. Some of our engineers uh, were working in two places. They uh, okay, that was going to be one okay. of my questions. If is if you ever worked in the desert, or if you were going back and no, forth at no, all? No, no, I, I, I never went. I never went up there. Some of the men did go up there. The engineers would go up there, but uh, 
I, I, I never went there. So to ask me some more questions. Yeah, so I just want to clarify. Um, so this is kind of an interesting part of your oh, history oh, that I actually I, don't. I, okay, uh, I, have an, I have an amendment to okay. add to this. And let's talk about international, Atomics International. Okay. Because that affected me. That affected me. Uh, sometime in the late between the time I went to work and 1960, there was an episode at Atomic International where they had a radiation leak <laughs> at Atomics International. That, and now, uh, <clears throat> when uh, Rocketdyne was a big place, and what they had to get around, they had a bus service. They had roads up there, and they had scheduled buses. The buses probably ran every five, six, seven minutes, all day long for years that they were running the bases. Uh, I, we, I went to work at seven o'clock in the morning there at Rocketdyne, got off at 3.30. Uh, to a degree, that's how the aerospace industry in Southern California worked on two shifts. Uh, most of the aircraft manufacturing companies uh, went to work at seven, the first shift and got off at 3.30, the second shift uh, started and got off roughly at 11 or 11.30. Sometimes they even ran a, uh, a, a graveyard shift from 11.30 to 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, let's see, from 11 to... Uh, Okay, I can't. Sometime think. in the morning. Yeah. All right. So they they had a a uh, a leak, a radiation leak, a serious one, and uh, I we never knew about it. They never told us anything about it. Uh, now, when some sometime in the late 1990s. Uh, this was after I lost Esther. Uh, I, uh, Rocket Dine, uh, oh, and still I have one more important thing to say. Rocket Dine was uh, sold by North American to, uh, a whole bunch of companies. I can't remember the name of the companies. Uh, uh, Boeing. Boeing was was one of the companies that owned Rocketdyne. <clears throat> after now, this happened after I retired. After I left them, I left them in 1966. Uh, uh, and I was passed my, my, when I retired, I got a pension from Rocketdyne, a four figure pension. Uh, that would be $62 and 48 cents, which I still get to this day. Awesome. <laughs> Not increased yeah. for inflation or anything? Huh? Hasn't increased for inflation or anything? No, no it, it, it was fixed. It was fixed. So I, I, I lose money every year. Okay, so I was passed off from company to company. And I can't think of, uh, of all the companies at it. There's five or six of them, but Boeing was one of them. Boeing owned Rocketdyne at one time. And, and then Boeing sold it to Aerojet General, which was a competitor of Rocketdyne's at the time. Uh, when they sold it to Aerojet General, for, for whatever reason, Boeing kept me. So I became a Boeing retiree. Uh, Boeing uh, asked uh, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company to manage 
uh, their, re their retirement. And as a matter of fact, uh, and this management turned into a, uh, uh, what's an insurance pension thing called? Annuity, an annuity, annuity. Annuity. Okay, they turned it into uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's called, and what's called an annuity. So uh, Boeing finally got rid of it. And this annuity is managed by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company now. So I get an annuity, my pension is turned into annuity. So I am uh, formerly a Boeing retiree and I never worked a minute for them in my life. Nice. <laughs> okay, so we have that out of the way. So let's get let's get back to Rocket Dine, and uh, we're uh, we're on the radiation. Okay, there was a. <clears throat> I I was involved in a in a very important uh, program. Uh, there were uh, there was. Uh, 20, uh, 22 or 23 of us, uh, technicians, engineers, instrumentation men, <clears throat> who were assigned the job of testing a, a new type of engine called the J2. Uh, this was the, the engine that powered the Apollo project uh, from Earth orbit after it was injected into Earth orbit to the moon. And the different thing and the difference thing about this engine was the uh, it had uh, the oxidizer was liquid oxygen, but the propellant was liquid hydrogen. Now they had never used uh, liquid hydrogen as a propellant before. Uh, but at the time, uh, pound for pound, it was the most uh, powerful rocket fuel we had at the time that was practical to use. So in addition to uh, uh, liquid oxygen, which is, uh, the liquids are called, are, uh, those uh, liquid, uh, uh, those gases that are liquefied are called cryogenics. So this is the first time that the hydrogen as a cryogenic was used for, for a fuel. And the engine that uh, they were developed, we were developing was called the, the J2. And very, and actually variations of the J2 uh, that were to come later propelled the uh, the uh, shuttle, the, the shuttles that we used for many years to uh, uh, service the uh, uh, space lab, et cetera, and all that. Uh, <clears throat> what our group was assigned to do was to test the J2 engine in a vacuum. Okay, think about that for a minute. What what surrounds us? Atmosphere. Oh, I was on view. I was going to say exactly. You have a lot of air that you're yeah, going to, yeah, have to isolate yeah. yourself from. Okay. Okay. What surrounds us is atmosphere, and our atmosphere is uh, is uh, roughly. Uh, 79% nitrogen, yep. uh, 20%, approximately 20% oxygen, and less than 1% of a bunch of noble gases. You, you're a climate scientist, practically. What? You, you have it down. <laughs> These numbers are, you okay. remember them. Okay. But, but, uh, but this engine was going to work in space. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah, this engine was going to work in space. So uh, uh, other engines also worked in space, but they 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 ignited 
in some in the atmosphere uh, at at some stage of the atmosphere. The Apollo engine was going to be in in, in, the, in the dead vacuum of space, and they had to develop a way to uh, start the engine, ignite the engine in a vacuum. Hmm. So here, here's what they did. They uh, and then they created in in this test cell with what had foreman had formerly had been a deflector, where the the uh, a rocket engine had been mounted on the test stand vertically, and then the exhaust from the rocket engine came down, hit a deflector, and turned it 90 degrees to a horizontal position. And uh, by spraying a lot of water into this, it kept from burning out the deflector. Well, they took out the deflector in this area, and they built a little chamber and it was roughly uh, maybe 16 feet long, maybe 12 feet wide, and uh, uh, seven feet tall, long, uh, high enough for somebody to be tall to be to stand in. Uh, then on the top of it, they had a thin aluminum sheet that was held uh, to the top of it with breakaway bolts. And what this sheet did, if the, for whatever reason, if the pressure inside this little chamber were to, in, in, to increase over a specified amount, it would blow out and keep from damaging and it would prevent an, an explosion. So if you cut an, can you cut off an explosion when it first starts the explosion they, and give the expansion some place to go, there, there won't be a serious explosion. Now, how do we, whoops, your lights just went out. Yeah, it's okay. okay. I'm still here. It's my computer being grumpy. Okay. Okay, uh, how do we get a, a, a vacuum inside this little chamber? Well, uh, by using a carburetor, so to speak. Okay, what they, what, I, what they did was make a big Venturi. Now there's laws of science I, I hate to get into, but when you run a uh, gaseous stream th through Venturi, the edges of the Venturi uh, with a little chamber that narrows up and then expands again. In the middle of it is the shortest distance and, and the sides of the Venturi because our curve is a longer distance. Uh, so in effect, I don't wanna get into the scientific things, but it creates a vacuum or a low pressure in the center of this Venturi. And that's how carburetors work. They create, they change, a, a, in, the, in the carburetor of a car, they change a, a liquid gasoline into a gaseous and mix it with air. So, uh, so enough for that. And uh, you uh, run a gaseous stream through this uh, fast enough, there's gonna be reduction of uh, pressure in the area of this middle uh, venturi and actually suck out the air in the chamber where we had the rocket engine uh, mounted. Now, how do we, what kind of gas do we use to suck out, to create, to run through the chamber before the engine starts so that we can evacuate the air from the chamber and start the engine in a vacuum? Uh, answer, steam. And how do you generate steam in a boiler? Okay, now they brought up a big boi boiler. Uh, 
I'm trying to remember what it looked like. If I'm not mistaken, it was uh, uh, it was a, an old locomotive. Now, in the, in the 1960s, was the prior to 1960s, the railroads went through a mass transition from steam to diesel power. So consequently, there were, uh, most of the steam engines were scrapped, but there were still lots of steam engines that were parked on a siding somewhere uh, for whatever reason. So apparently they got a, a, a big steam locomotive engine. Uh, did, did they have two of them? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, they had this big boiler up there and what they would do would fire it up and they, they built up a, a, they had a chamber in which the steam uh, was piped to the chamber. Uh, in any event, the way we would fire the engine now, we mounted the engine in the, in the chamber below the test stand. It was mounted horizontally. And uh, we uh, fired it prior to the uh, firing of the engine. It took uh, some time, I'm not sure, it took hours to build up enough steam pressure for this, maybe two, three hours, four hours, I, I forget which. And uh, uh, we would run the test span just like we run on any test except with the uh, changes I've, I've just noted. And uh, there was a program, they have a program start. And when you turn the start switch, it doesn't turn on the engine right away, but it goes through a whole series of events. Uh, and after going through all these events, then the engine, if everything worked like it was supposed to, then the engine would start. And one of these events was running steam uh, through the Venturi. That would lower the, the pressure in the uh, chamber where the engine was. And uh, when it followed, if, every, if everything went like it was according, uh, supposed to do, then the engine would start in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I spent the last two years, I think three years, I was working at Rock Rocketdyne uh, testing this engine. We, we, we did this for a long time. I forget what it was, but the, uh, the object of the, uh, of the test was to call, we had a certified, we had a license to certify it for space, which we eventually did. And uh, we, we got a commendation from NASA for it. I, I had it at what time? at one time, and I don't know what happened to it. I got a commendation. Well, all the people that worked on it got, got the commendation uh, for it, uh, because without certifying this thing, uh, we would have never gone to the moon. Yeah, so so just to clarify for me, the the stage, this so it eventually did get put onto the Apollo rockets, right? It, what? It, it, it this eventually did you it it was put onto the Apollo rockets okay. and it was okay it, it it was the last stage of the of the Apollo that there was uh, uh, three stages the booster there was the second stage uh, if if I'm not uh, the the second the booster put it in uh, towards orbit the second stage would inject it into orbit and the the uh, last stage which had the capsule where the uh, astronauts went then it had a, a service module uh, mounted behind that which carried the uh, uh, liquid oxygen for um, and a uh, converter what do they that converts oxygen into electricity. You can, 
you, you can actually uh, turn uh, liquid oxygen into electricity because that's that uh, other, otherwise if if you needed batteries you there's no way you could carry batteries up there to for all your uh, electrical needs so they carry these tanks of liquid oxygen incidentally it was one of these tanks of oxygen on apollo 13 that uh, that blew up if, if you remember apollo 13 there was an explosion and they they were supposed to go to the moon and they they uh never went to the moon they had to continue where they were they had to turn around the moon and come back to earth again you you remember that i'm sure i saw the movie so there's a movie with uh that there's, there's, as a matter of fact this what what's this friday wednesday night i watched it oh really uh, yeah yeah tom hanks played uh uh the astronaut that was in charge novel i think was his name yeah yeah uh, wednesday night i watched it great great movie i i've probably seen it a dozen times i'd like to watch it with you now so the 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 engine that's on the the last stage so i i'm i'm not a rocket person uh, at least i that's the i'm trying to picture it. the j2 was is on that last stage when they're going when they're actually in space to power to what's that <clears throat> the J2 uh, engine, the one that you worked on. Yeah, yeah. It was the one that, th it's the one that they use on the last, on the, the uh, on, on, on the last stage, yeah, to, to, in, to uh, uh, give enough velocity to escape, to escape Earth's uh, uh, gravity. Yeah, that's, that was the third stage. I, actually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the last stage was, uh, was attached to a, a vehicle that, uh, that had two two engine two J two engines because now we're 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 working in space. Uh, it had a start in space. Uh, yeah, uh, and then the the last stage had the uh, had the service module, which had these uh, these two tanks of liquid oxygen for generating electricity. All the time, the uh, the uh, Apollo capsule went to the moon. Uh, it also carried the moon lander. There was a lander. Uh, what they did when they when they got in, in their space, the the service module was separated from the third stage, and then they would turn around and with their thrusters and come back and attach themselves to the to the moon lander and pull it out of the third stage and then take the lander with them to the moon so the vehicle went to the, the went to the moon uh had the uh the uh capsule where the astronauts were it had the service module uh, incidentally, the capsule that the uh, astronauts were in, they also had a shield in it for re-entry in the Earth's atmosphere when it got back. And it had, this, again, the service module. And then behind the uh, service module, there was the moon lander. And then behind the moon lander, there was... Uh, um, liquid hydrogen and separate liquid hydrogen and oxygen tanks and then i think there were two j2 engines to uh take the third stage to exit velocity then when they reached exit velocity is when they separated from the third stage pulled pulled out the moon lander to take them take it with them to the moon and the the third stage would eventually fall back to Earth somewhere. Okay, so the the, the, the J twos don't go up to didn't go to the moon. They just they're the last part to to launch to the moon. Well, well, the the, the uh, uh, no, I I I I think 
there were three three J two engines on on the on the third stage. Uh, the capsule that went to the moon was part of the third stage. The third okay. stage separated uh, because uh, they they needed the thrust from the J two to get to exit velocity to leave Earth's, Earth's gravity. I, I understand I, that. I was just when they're maneuvering, like to get in space. Do they use the J two also to maneuver within space, like if they're okay. going to orbit? Or okay, you're you're back? okay. You're you're in space. Uh, if 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 you wanna uh, if you wanna change your direction in space, uh, there's there's no gravity. You're you're you have the gravity of the sun. You have the gravity of the earth, you have the gravity of the moon, you have galaxy gravity. Uh, it's, it's a very complicated mathematical thing. And you, you have to think about the people who had to uh, create the equations to do all of this. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's mind boggling, it's mind boggling. This is very cool. Um, I didn't realize you worked on um, at, well, I kind of, I barely knew you worked at Rocketdyne, but I didn't realize you were involved with um, yeah. a lot of these engines with the um, space program and in, including the Apollo program. Okay. So I assume that the J2 is because you said for the Apollo program, since it was the third stage, they were able to do it in the Santa Susana Mountains as opposed to out in the desert because they're, we, we, they're yeah, smaller we, ones. Okay, the, the J2, uh, developed less than 200,000 pounds of thrust. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, it, we were capable of testing it and, and, and we had to modify a, uh, a whole test. I think this was at the Boehm area. Uh, I, I, I don't remember. Now, uh, I also talked about the contamination from Atomics International. Uh, and I think we talked at a stage where I uh, I was never told by Rockadine that I was exposed to radiation at that at that time. Uh, I there were hundreds of people working at Rockadine, actually uh, maybe close at one time, close maybe two two thousand people there at its at its peak. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know how old I am now. I'm uh, one year and four months from being a century old. And uh, I sometimes think what a lucky guy I am uh, because I understand the radi radiation leak was quite serious. Uh, I don't remember ever being contacted by uh, and NASA, the government or anything else telling me that I was exposed to radiation. They, they never, I don't ever remember them uh, checking with me. And I found out about this after the fact. Uh, it was either in the late 1990s or early 2020s, or early 2000s. As, as you know, Rocketdyne was a contaminated space and they've been, They've literally spent billions of dollars trying to contaminate it. Uh, three years ago, uh, I got an invitation from another org from a an organization that's affiliated with anti-contamination. I don't know what it, uh, what the name was. You know, eventually, Lucille and I. Uh, went up there and we took a tour of it. Uh, and everything that I was familiar with up there is gone. Uh, components test lab was gone. Components, after I went there, they built another one called Components Test Lab <coughs> 2. That was gone. The roads are gone. The bowl area was gone. 
And the only thing that was left was the delta, the test area. <clears throat> they still had to have, they retained two stands there. Uh, I presume the stands were decontaminated and everything. Uh, it was like old homecoming. I still have a uh, a picture on my phone of revisiting the test stands. I was searching for it, but I never organized all my pictures. Maybe uh, I can get uh, Roger or uh, your mother to uh, help me uh, organize if I could. I'd like to find those pictures. Yeah, I'd love to see them. Actually, I'd like to see a lot of your pictures. Yeah, we'll save yeah. that for another day. Um, even if they're unorganized, it'd be interesting to see it. Um, so th this is this is actually fascinating to me because I remember. I mean, Rocketdyne was still in operation when I was a kid, and yes. growing up in Simi Valley, I can remember being woken up in the morning from you know just hearing just the. Did, did, did you ever hear those engines go? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can remember. I mean, I have distinct memories of my childhood of just all of a sudden just the entire house yeah. just shaking. And it's not an earthquake. It's you can hear the just the rumble. And you knew that because, you know, it's probably by, you know, maybe four miles away from Rocketdyne by, you know, um, yeah. the way the bird flies. So they were doing that. I mean, so I, when you were doing these testing, it was like that, I assume, right? You were, I bet you were like. Exactly. I mean, how far well, away from the test are okay. you? You're in you're in the next room or something, right? When you're doing well, these tests. Okay, no, we're <laughs> uh, yeah, the the room is pretty pretty sturdy. They got concrete, reinforced concrete walls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We essentially uh, we were safe, but we were also maybe a quarter of a mile away from the test stand. Okay, we, so it's about a quarter yeah, of a mile. Yeah, yeah the t the the. Uh, Okay, where 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 we where all the instrumentation was and everything, yeah, we, it was remote from the test stand. We we faced it. Uh, we'd have to leave the area, and yeah. I assume it was still pretty loud, <clears throat> even for you guys, that you had to have like ear protection and that type of stuff. Okay, we only had two forms of protection there. Number one, we had a hard hat. And number two, we had safety glasses. We never had anything from the ears because the protocol at that time, uh, nobody ever thought uh, that the, uh, the uh, my hearing, the problems I have with my hearing right now, I can uh, attribute uh, to them. Because when, when you watch the, uh, like at the uh, at CTL, we would get alarms that they were going to have a firing at the bull area, which is probably a quarter of a mile away from us. But we didn't have to go inside. The, over the, uh, at the entrance of control lab, they had a big red uh, alarm light. It would go on and start rotating. And we knew they were going to run a test run up there. And uh, most of the guys would go inside, but did, uh, I, I, I went outside a couple of times to see what these things look like. And I was watching them, could watch a rocket engine uh, fire. And the exhaust from that is so intense, you can, you can see what's called mock diamonds in the exhaust of a rocket engine. It's mm -hmm. called a mock diamond because that comes out, of course, it exceeds the speed of sound. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Ask questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you have a phone call. Oh, hold on. My phone's ringing. Okay. It's a scam. Ignore it. Oh, it says scam likely. I got Okay. <laughs> it, I read, but go ahead. Oh, wow. So, yeah. This, um, so, um, I'm trying to think of whether we want to get into the, some of this stuff. Um, well, like whether we do, should do the question, do the people, uh, do this family or anybody else watching this, are they interested in that? Uh, oh, yeah. Some, I, uh, some might be, but I think most of them 
were hopefully they would be more interested in me and to what I did. Well, I mean, it's all, I mean, uh, this is all, to, it's interesting to hear what you did. Like, I didn't know you were, you were involved. You played a role in the Apollo program. That's yeah. news to me. Uh, with we, these... we, okay, we can talk a little bit what happened to me when I left. Uh, well, I'd like to talk, well, I'm, I'm, it's more yeah, of the time. We're, we're about an hour in, and I actually want to talk to you um, uh, about some stuff related to um, uh, basically personal life during that time period and such. Okay, um, go ahead. But I, I'm wondering if we should wait till the next uh, time uh, to, well, we can, let's do it right now. So okay. I, I'll, since you're, you're in a good mood and you're, you're, you're talking, so. Um, so this period, it seems like it was pretty intense, like during the, these oh, years. I have, I have to add one, one more thing. Uh, and that's, and that's income. I worked at, at, at Rocketdyne from 1955 to 1966, uh, 11 years, actually a little over 11 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's a period I went, I went to work, uh, Mark, when I went to work for the Mark was three years old. And Judy, your mother was one year old. Mark was born in 1952, and Judy in 1954. I left Rockadine in 1955. Uh, in in working there, I worked a lot of overtime. And there was, as a matter of fact, there were a couple nights I didn't even come home. Some nights working, I didn't even come home. Uh, we didn't, of course, didn't have cell phones in, and uh, uh, ordinarily I, I would be home, uh, we got off work at 3.30, I'd, I'd get home about a quarter after four on, on a daily basis, but I worked more overtime than I didn't, and sometimes I would work to, to midnight, so Esther had to take on on this load, and I know I know it 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 affected her, and probably not not in a good way. Uh, for eleven years, I missed some of the things I should have been doing. Uh, uh, raising the family instead of I was working. So I, 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 I probably had it for the week, uh, maybe eight hours overtime. Sometimes I would work Saturday and Sunday. Lots of overtime, lots and lots of overtime. Um, and of course, the flip side of that was it uh, helped furnish our house, uh, bought cars for us. Uh, everything, uh, it, it, it got to a point where we depended upon that income. And after I, after I left Rocket Nine, uh, I'd come, uh, let's see, the, uh, in 1966, Mark was already 14 years old. Judy was uh, 12 years old. Um, my kids are half grown al already. Uh, and then in 1966, I left Rockadine and lost that income. <laughs> uh, so in, in order to make up for it, I got a part-time job at Pep Boys when it was in, in Reseda. And I would work there uh, four hours a night on, on Friday nights. I would work all day Saturday. They were closed at the time on Sunday. And they, I would work Monday nights. So that would augment my income. Uh, it wasn't like over, overtime. But uh, 
it helped. And I, I, I remember one occasion, I'd been working there for a while. I don't know how long it was. One, one day at, at dinner, Esther looks at me and she says, what do you do with the overtime money? Uh, inferring, why didn't I put the money I was making at Pep Boys into the pot? And I, and I had to remind her that uh, every week that uh, I gave her a check endorsed check and she would deposit it. And what I would do with, with my the money that I earned in the overtime, first of all, it ran the car. I put gas in the car if there were and the expenses on the car that come out of my money. Uh, so I had to remind her of this and, and she didn't realize that. She, she got the check and everything went to uh, running the house and uh, supporting the family. Any more questions? Did you enjoy working at Rocketdyne? Huh? Did, did I enjoy, enjoy? Did you enjoy working at Rocketdyne? Well, it it it, it was an, it was an experience to be involved in in something that shaped history, so to speak. Yes, yes. The uh, because I I I contributed to something to it, and to a degree they depended. They depended upon me you know, doing my job. Uh, and, and, my, and my job was uh, partially me mechanical, uh, partially electrical. Uh, in the test cells in the component test lab where we had to they, if the uh, development department gave us a component to test, there was an engine engineer who was in charge of the test and he had to create a program in which we would mount the, the component to be tested. Uh, it had to be fuel, we had to run fuel to it. We had to run power to it. We had to run instrumentation to it and uh, uh, that's what I had to do when I was working on a test cell. Uh, I had an incident one time and I found out I needed glasses. Uh, test stands are constantly being modified. Uh, it's set up for one engine. When you're done with that and you get a, a different type of engine or to test there, they might have to make changes to the test stand to actually test the engine. So, and uh, a way that would work in the instrumentation room, they would have a junction box and the junction box would be uh, electrically run a series of wires that was bound in a cable uh, from that junction box in the instrumentation room to a junction box in the test cell almost two identical boxes. And uh, all of these little wires in the cables would be numbered and they would attach, uh, the wire would be numbered. Uh, the, the first series of numbers would be the number of, uh, the number of the cable it was in. And then they would be numbered like A1 or B1, AA1. Uh, a, a series of numbers, and these would be uh, a, attached to a, uh, a, uh, a, a block of uh, connections that had a number, uh, whatever it was. And then uh, the way they would instrument the component, they would select a instrument number 
in the instrument room, uh, run a cable from that instrument to a, a terminal number on the terminal block that the cables that went from the instrument room to the test cell uh, were on. So each uh, electrical junction on the uh, on this strip had a number. They would put the instrument number cable on this number. Then in the test cell, there was a duplicate of that box. That one wire ran to the same numbered uh, junction in the test cell. And then we could, if, if a certain perimeter had to go from, say, let's let's just call it oxygen pressure, oxygen pressure, what the uh, uh, pressure of the oxygen was that was being instrumented at that time. Well, the engineer would say, run a wire from the perimeter to junction box number one, a terminal, such and such a number. And then inside the instrument room in their junction box, they would take the same terminal and run it to the uh, selected instrument that was going to record that perimeter. So, so that's, that's what we had to do. Now wired, you just couldn't run a wire from there to the, where the perimeter was because uh, there's an explosion or uh, an oxygen link or a fire or something like that. The data could be destroyed. So you had to put the wire inside a conductor, a conduit. So that's, uh, that's uh, just a small example of the work we had to do. Uh, run a conduit from the junction box to the, and each test was different, a different component. You, you couldn't use the, 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 the same uh, 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 conduits uh, over and over again. So uh, we had to take uh, aluminum tubing. If it was, if the, if it was a hazardous thing, uh, had to use stainless steel if, you, if uh, sometimes because stainless steel is much more uh, durable than aluminum. So that so that's that's one of the things I I did there. So on on the test stand we have the same thing, except the test stands about a quarter of a mile away from the instrument room, and there's wires that exist between the test stand and the instrument room. You alter both ends of the wire. Okay, you alter both ends of the wire, but you select uh, conductors between the two of them. What to do? So in this case, I I had to open an instrument box on on the on the test stand to join certain wires together so that we would get the right perimeter down in the. Uh, where the engine was. Now, uh, what had happened on this particular test stand, they altered the test stand for whatever reason, and they put a, a vertical structural beam in front of the uh, junction box, maybe uh, less than 20 inches away less than 20 inches away. And uh, I went to alter this. Now, whoever put this in there didn't know there was a junction box there. And the people that put it in never looked at the junction box. But when I got to that, I couldn't open the one door of the junction box all the way because this beam, the structural beam they added, gotten away of the door. And I had to add this, uh, alter this terminal so that our instruments would read write. And I couldn't get close enough uh, or to it, or to either close enough or 
And anyway, I couldn't put my head in a position where I could read what the number of the of the uh, terminal was. Now I knew at the top it was it was number one, and I could count down. But if I couldn't see the number, I couldn't be positive. I couldn't be positive I was on the right terminal. And anyway, the point of this is that's how I found out I needed glasses because. Uh, uh, one thing led to another. Eventually, I got glasses. I could put the glasses. Now, uh, I can't see close, but I, I can get back and I can I can see the distance. And, and right now, I'm getting close to you. You're getting a little fuzzy. Even though I got glasses, when, when I come back here, you clear up. Continue. Another question. No, I think we're, I well, I think we're just about done. I have... Um... I one I, I have one last question. Um, so the overtime you, you worked, the I assume that the the demands at that job there. I mean there was the demands from higher up were pretty uh, intense because the, mm -hmm. everyone's on a deadline. There was constantly uh, oh yeah there's there's, yeah, there's the more time. work there's more work to be done than okay. possible okay. to do it, which is partly why you end up doing. I don't know, I'm just trying to, I'm okay. trying to see where the overtime there, came from. There, there was more work to be done than we could do. Yes. All the time, all the time, because sometime it took months to, to develop, we'd test the product and we'd find a problem with it. As let, let me give you an example, uh, feeding liquid oxygen, uh, feeding a cryogenic, to an engine or a component, uh, you're you're working. Uh, let's see, liquid nitrogen is something like 325 degrees below zero. Uh, li liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen is probably not not quite that cold. I'm 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 not I'm not sure of the of 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 the figures and you're um, a pressure controller now the way a pressure controller works is uh, generally they have a little cylinder with a piston in it and behind the piston is a spring uh, by varying the pressure on the spring you can, uh, the pressure required to depress the piston varies. Now the head of the piston is exposed to the pressure of the uh, fluid being controlled, it's having its, its pressure controlled. Uh, which, which means the little piston inside the cylinder is constantly working back and forth. The pressure gets too much, it moves uh, through a series of ports, it, it alters the pressure being set. So by continually working back and forth, you can set the pressure of something you, which you want. And this can go up into the thousands of pounds of pressure, thousands of pounds per inch per pressure. And what you're asking this little piston to do is work is working back and forth. Uh, the pressure gets too great, it moves, it releases the pressure, the pressure goes down, now it becomes too little, so it, it moves back. And moving back and forth, it covers and uncovers ports in the cylinder to, uh, to change all that. It, it, it's a complicated thing, uh, but anyway, that's how it works. And what happened on this uh, pressure regulator, and so you can do the same thing with a diaphragm too. A di diaphragm would have a spring behind it. Then the, the one side of the diaphragm would have this pressure and the other side would be, it would be countered by the spring and whatever the pressure on the spring was set, uh, you, you could control pressure that way. That would be mostly uh, gases. That would be for gases. Uh, 
So on this one, one uh, pressure controller for uh, controlling the pressure of a high uh, cryogenic, uh, it works essentially the same for liquid oxygen or liquid uh, nitrogen or liquid hydrogen, uh, except they, they uh, uh, both have different settings. And this the little piston works like a, like mad going back and forth. And what it would do, it would gall. Uh, aluminum is relatively soft compared to steel or many other products. And then extreme pushing uh, pressure on it and it would gall. So we were months and months on the original regulator and uh, I don't know how many regulators we, we destroyed uh, when their cylinder walls were damaged in effect. It's one big casting. It's made out of, out of aluminum because weight is a big factor. And uh, 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 eventually they came out with a stainless steel sleeve that would go in the, instead of having just boring out the, the hole there to put, have an aluminum, the walls of the cylinder being aluminum, they uh, went to steel. And, but it took, it took a certain type of steel. So we had an experiment over and over again. We were months and months doing that. Uh, but we, we finally, the engineers finally found a, a uh, combination on which uh, we could regulate the uh, pressure of uh, cryogenics uh, without uh, galling up the walls of the sensing piston. Okay, that that was was one example. Uh, there, there's other examples. Uh, when you're developing all this thrust, you are delivering fuel and oxidizer uh, to the head of the engine and, and it has a big inject, injection plate in which large amounts of, of cryogenics of, uh, would go into it and it would exit in, into the chamber through these, uh, these inject, uh, injection ports that were drilled into it. Now, on the, I, I told you about the uh, big uh, booster engine that did a million a pound. Well, that, that had a plate on it. Uh, the head, uh, the uh, exit dome of the rocket engine had a diameter probably of about 10 feet. It, it was a monster engine, it was called King Kong. That was a nickname we named for it, King Kong. Uh, but the injector for it, the little plate that sit on top was four feet in diameter. And that literally had thousands of these little holes. Now the holes had to be in certain spots. And by us testing these heads, uh, they found ways to take pictures of it. Uh, it's, it, it was mind boggling what we had to go through. Uh, uh, if, if these things had to be uh, in, inject uh, fuel and it had to keep it cool enough to keep from burning up. Now, cool is, a, is, is an object. Uh, you know how refrigeration works, don't you? Generally, yes. Yeah, okay. You take a, uh, a, a liquid, that uh, boils at a low temperature. What I mean by low temperature, maybe uh, below the freezing temperature of water. And uh, you run this liquid through an evaporator, then run over it. And the warm air that's being run through it turns this liquid from a liquid to a gas, maybe at a very low temperature. And so it, so it collects that heat 
and then what's left when you take heat away from from a gas it leaves cold and leaves a lesser temperature okay now you it's being turned into a gas now you have to turn it back into a liquid again so it goes from the evaporator into something called a condenser that's the outside unit and but now this liquid has all this heat in it now heat is relevant the the, the difference between uh, zero and 100 degrees is the same as the difference between 2,900 and 3,000 degrees. Uh, the physical points between them uh, are, are the same. So here we have a liquid that's collected heat that's probably in the mid 150 degree temperature maybe as high as 200 degrees going through a condenser in which the condenser is operating in an environment of maybe 115 degrees. How do we cool a room? How, how do we get rid of the heat outside? Well, so we, we have a liquid that's uh, maybe uh, 150, 175, 200 degrees going through an evaporator that's maybe a hundred degrees, the hot weather, but we're the same way. The difference in temperature is relative, whether it's low or it's high, the same laws apply. Well, okay, lesson, lesson over. Now, now do you, you want to continue? Yeah, I think we're, I, this has been actually a really interesting um, uh, session. Um, I think we're probably, pre I, I don't have too many questions. I don't really have any questions for you specifically. I mean, I could, but um, it's just to get into more detail and stuff. Um, okay. But uh, I think it would probably be a good time to wrap up for today. And um, when we pick up next time, we can and, okay. uh, hear some more hear about you. other parts of uh, what was going on in your life. Um, yeah, this has been actually fantastic. It well, was, this has been uh, an hour and 45 minutes. Well, a little less than an hour long, probably the longest session we've had. Yeah. So uh, it's, but it's been interesting. It, you, it was, uh, th this is an interesting time. Um, uh, I'm, I, okay. I'm sorry. My head can't supply a lot of the, a lot of the specific <laughs> details anymore, but it, I'm speaking in generalities now. And, you're, uh, you're, <laughs> You you have way more detail than <laughs> than most people would have on something that was going on fifty over well over fifty years ago. Um, you're it's uh, incredibly detailed. Six, Sixty five years ago. You have even better maths than me right now. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. Um, well, so let's uh, uh, we'll pick this up. We'll pick up again. Um, hopefully very soon. Um, this is actually really interesting. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot for letting us know. Yeah. And I, I enjoy spending these sessions with you because uh, we, we've missed a lot, Ryan. We've yeah, well, we've, you've yeah. been busy and we've, and I've been busy. So, uh, which is not a bad thing, um, but we'll, we'll make sure to get some more of these. Okay. okay. Well, have a good day now. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.